Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on suicide prevention in the construction industry. I am Sonia Bowen, the Executive Director of the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. I'm happy to be here to represent CIASP alongside my co-host for today's event, CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and the Labor's Health and Safety Fund of North America. I'll be moderating today's webinar with the support from CPWR's Jessica Bunting, and I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules before we hand it over to Dr. Trueblood to start the presentation. Like all CPWR webinars, this event will be recorded and will be posted online, shared in, the follow in a follow-up email with everyone who registered for the event. The slides are already available online and we'll be dropping links to those and other relevant resources in the chat throughout our webinar. All attendees are automatically muted for the duration of the event, but you should feel free to type your questions into the chat or the Q&A box at any time. We will respond to as many of the pre-submitted and live questions as we can in the hour allotted. And we'll hold on to any that we don't get for future webinars. You may have also seen that we have a simultaneous translation option for Spanish audio available today. With that, I'd like to take a minute to thank all of you for being here to learn more about suicide prevention. It's a challenging topic to discuss, but the more that we talk about it, the better chances we have at reducing the extremely high number of suicide deaths in our industry. Our aim is that you will leave this conversation with information, tools, resources, and hope that we can stop construction suicide. Now, it is my pleasure to do, introduce today's panelists. Dr. Amber Trueblood is the Data Center Director at CPWR. Jessica Bunting is the Research to Practice Director at CPWR, as well as an at-large member of, the, of CIASP's Board of Trustees. Jamie Becker is the licensed clinical social worker and is the director of health promotion for the Laborers Health and Safety Fund of North America, as well as the chairperson for CIASP. And Trish Calabresi is the senior vice president of programming at AFSP National. Thank you all for being here. And Amber, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Sonia, for that great introduction. Go ahead and start sharing my slides here. As mentioned, for those that don't know who I am, I'm Amber Trueblood, CPWR's Data Center Director. I'm excited to be here today with such a diverse and distinguished panel of presenters. We're all working towards improving mental health among construction workers. Today, I'm going to be providing a very quick overview of data on mental health trends. Um, I'm always the number person, so if you see me on an outline or on a presentation, I'll be coming with the statistics, but I'll keep it short today. So we have three recent publications coming from our data center, our collaborations with the data center. The first is our September 2024 data bulletin, which was published yesterday around lunch. It's currently available at cpwr.com for free. This issue um, examines mental health trends among construction workers. We look at anxiety, depression, serious psychological distress, um, whether construction workers were seeing mental health professionals, medication use for anxiety or depression, as well as begins to examine suicide and overdose trends. In addition, we have two manuscripts in the American Journal of Industrial Medicine. The first was led by my team and it examined suicides among construction workers in the United States using mortality data coming from the CDC. The second was a collaboration that I participated on that highlights a project in which we assess bullying and harassment among construction workers. I'm now going to quickly go through select findings from these publications. And I do want to note there are a lot of great statistics and information available in these, but I did keep it short, just a high level overview due to available time. If you have any questions or want any additional statistics, please feel free to reach out to me directly. So first, let's go ahead and examine data coming from the National Health Interview Survey. 
um, which is included in our most recent data bulletin. It examines anxiety or depression among construction workers. We found overall 15.4% of construction workers had anxiety or depression based on reported symptoms or medication use in 2021. We also found some demographics at higher rates compared to all construction workers. The highest rate of anxiety or depression were among female construction workers with 34.9% reporting anxiety or depression in 2021. Other groups with higher prevalence of anxiety or depression based on uh, symptoms or medication use were Black or African-American workers, non-Hispanic workers, workers with any college, workers with good, fair, or poor health status, and workers born in the United States. And we have all of those trends uh, numbers here on the slide, but I didn't want to just read those to you. Um, overall, 14.5% of workers had anxiety and 6.2% had depression. Um, and that's where we get that 15.4%, um, which indicates some workers had both anxiety and depression. We then examined data also from the National Health Interview Survey on construction workers seeing mental health professionals. We see overall about 5% of construction workers reported seeing a mental health professional in the past 12 months. However, when we look at if by anxiety or depression status that the percentage increases to 16% of construction workers with anxiety or depression reported seeing someone in the past 12 months. Um, compared to 3% of construction workers seeing a mental health professional um, without anxiety or depression. In addition, not shown on the slide, we examined if workers reported delaying care uh, with a mental health professional. Overall, 4% of construction workers reported they delayed seeing a mental health professional due to the cost, and another 4% did not see a mental health professional due to the cost. We're now going to transition gears a little bit and look at CDC mortality data and C4 fatal work injuries also presented in the data bulletin. I want to just uh, throw a small caveat out here um, that mortality data and C4 data, the populations aren't you know one to one directly comparable. However, this gives us a good idea of what is occurring among construction workers. And if you have any method questions, feel free to check out our latest data bulletin or ping me and I can get into those weeds. And so we found um, there were 17.2 times as many overdose deaths as fatal work injuries. Um, so we had about 17,000 overdose, overdose deaths among construction workers aged 16 to 64 years old, compared to about 990 fatal work injuries. In addition, there were 5.3 times as many suicide deaths as fatal work injuries among construction workers. So coming in around 5,200 versus that 990 figure I just reported. In addition, of those aged 16 to 64 who died by overdose, more than one in six worked in construction. Um, and so that is shown in our data bulletin. In addition, of those who died by suicide, almost one in seven with a reported industry were construction workers. And so we definitely see construction workers are overrepresented in overdose and suicide fatalities. Next, looking at select findings from a recent manuscript um, on suicide deaths. Now I want to note, this is the same data presented in the data bulletin. It's just a year older due to publication timelines and all of that. So what we see is that construction overall had a suicide death rate that was 2.4 times higher than all industries at 46.1 versus 19.5 per 100,000 workers. This is comparable to estimates reported by the CDC. In addition, we see MELS ha also had a higher suicide death rate um, when we break out by MELS female. So MELS is our middle bar, the dark gray are MELS um, for both. And so we see very similar 50.5 per 100,000 among male construction workers versus 30 per 100,000 for males in all industries. 
um, not shown on the slide are the numbers for females, which are, it's really important we do um, include. Um, ran out of space, didn't want to overwhelm and make the font too small. Um, the female rate, which is also higher for female construction workers, and so we often drop females from this. However, females in construction's rate was higher compared to those in all industries at 9.4 versus 7.6 per 100,000 workers. So we definitely, we still see increased risk among female construction workers, a higher rate. Next, looking at demographic and characteristics by sex, we see differences between males and females. Among male construction workers, the highest rates were among workers who are 55 to 64 years old, American Indian or Alaska Native, non-Hispanic, completed high school or equivalent, and single. Um, the highest rate, just so I didn't just toss a ton of numbers out, I just picked the highest rate, was among single males, which was 1.8 times higher than all industries at 77.9 versus 43.4 per 100,000 workers. Next, when we transition to female construction workers, we do see similar demographics um, with higher rates, um, including female workers who are 55 to 64 years old, those who completed high school or equivalent, single, and the highest rate was among those who completed high school equivalent for female workers, which was 1.3 times higher than all industries at 14.3 versus 11.3 per 100,000 workers. And again, these are um, suicide rates. The next question we um, get frequently when we're looking at mental health um, overdoses and suicides is trade specific. And so we were able to, in our latest manuscript, go ahead and look at occupations. I do wanna note some occupations could not actually be examined due to small cell sizes that created unstable estimates. You're going, what is an unstable estimate? Um, I'm not here for a stats lesson. Essentially, that's just data we don't trust. So. Um, we go in, we look at the cell sizes, and if it's too small, it's producing unreliable estimates that we don't want to actually make any sort of um, interpretations with. So we excluded those. This is also why we could not examine occupations for female workers. It's not that we did not want to examine these. It's just that the um, sample size and cell size got too small to actually produce anything reliable. So that's my only stat rant in here, I promise. <laughs> Um, of the occupations included for male construction workers, we see the top five suicide rates were among iron and steel workers, our welders, our brick masons, crane tower operators, and laborers. And so when you look iron and steel workers, the rate comes in at 117.89. So if you're remembering um, a few slides ago, I said for male construction workers, the rate was 50.5. So iron and steel workers is more than double that rate there. So at 117 versus 50.5. Um, and so all of our top occupations had higher rates than all male construction workers. Here's my contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions or um, provide any additional data um, as they come up. Um, I'm now going to pass things over to Jess, who's going to talk about creating a culture of care. Thanks, Amber. Hopefully everyone is seeing um, my slides now. Um, so, you know, obviously the data shows that we clearly need to do more as an industry to help one another. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the idea of creating a culture of care and the role that employers can play in preventing suicides. First, what is a culture of care? Maybe you've heard the term before, but it's meant to describe a philosophy that prioritizes creating a work environment where individuals feel valued, supported, and as though they are part of a community that genuinely cares about their well-being. Cultivating a culture of care is important for both the physical and the psychological safety of workers, allowing them to bring their authentic selves to work and enabling everyone to feel comfortable pointing out and addressing issues with the support of leadership, whether that's a physical safety hazard or something related to psychological well-being. 
um, is, is really important. And today we're obviously focused on the latter, uh, but creating a culture of, of care, I think is relevant across the board when it comes to safety and health. You might ask yourself, but why is it the employer's responsibility to look out for the worker's psychological well-being specifically? And part of that is, you know, I'll just say as humans in a community, in this case, the community being the workplace, I think that we should look out for one another just because it's the right thing to do. Um, but possibly more important than that is the fact that the construction industry just comes with its own distinct risk factors that can contribute to suicide deaths. And we're seeing that play out in the numbers that Amber just talked about. And so I've outlined some of the um, industry-related risk factors for suicide. And Trisha will talk a little bit more about how these um, interrelate with personal risk factors. But I think we all know that the industry um, and employers put a lot of pressure on workers to work both quickly and effectively um, with a low margin for error. There is um, job instability, or even when the economy is good and uh, people have stable jobs, there can be feelings of job uncertainty. Um, we obviously have high injury rates, and with that comes chronic pain, um, which leads to another point on here um, related to drug use and the use of opioids. Um, there is a lack of paid leave, so people are working through illness, they're working through injury, they're not getting paid unless they work. Um, they also are um, having poor access to or utilization of health care for many of the same reasons, and that includes behavioral health care. Often people have to travel to find work in construction, and that can create isolation and separation from family and friends. Um, there is a lack of leadership training. Often the structure of um, employers is such that they promote based on skill. And so if somebody is very good at their job, at the trade that they do, they can get promoted, but they have not learned the soft skills associated with leadership. And so there is not that training built in. Um, alcohol and drug use is often normalized in the industry. Um, and then there are lots of, a lot of demographics at play. Amber did talk about how uh, both men and women are impacted by this, um, but we do think some demographics are a factor, such as it being a male-dominated industry with a tough guy mentality. There are a lot of veterans in the workforce, that kind of a thing. <clears throat> So how does a company create a culture of care to help insulate against those risk factors that I just talked about and other risk factors? One way is by providing leadership training and support. Um, this includes, as I mentioned, soft skills, communication skills. Um, it includes the uh, ability to lead by example, teaching people how to do that. And then another key component um, in the construction industry is safety leadership. Um, you can see I have the Be a Safety Leader sticker on there for the CPWR Foundations for Safety Leadership course. Um, I wanted to uh, point that out because in the PDF of the slides, this, uh, these images are linked. Um, so that's a good one to check out. Um, and it helps with not only safety leadership, but also uh, communication and general leadership skills. Um, setting up injury management programs and return to work programs um, are really beneficial. Um, and also working to reduce the reliance on prescription opioids because often that can happen because workers feel like they have to get back to their full schedule immediately. They have to work through the pain and the only way they can do that is with painkillers. Offering paid leave is a big one. Um, being flexible with scheduling, um, having multiple shift uh, times, staggered shifts, so people can start and work when it's most convenient for them and fit in things like childcare and doctor's appointments um, and life in general. Setting reasonable ex expectations, even, you know, I know pressure comes from ab above, comes from the, the owner, um, but making sure that uh, your employees don't feel like they have to rush through work and sacrifice their own safety and well-being is really critical. Um, implementing second chance agreements, um, cultivating peer support programs, um, 
building in protective factors for veterans, knowing um, lo about local support programs for veterans and being able to point people there is a great way to build a culture of care. Um, starting to use or promoting an existing EAP employee assistance program or manager assistance, member assistance program. Um, leading uh, and destigmatizing by example. This often includes a lot of intangible things, but it, you know, it can mean um, sharing your own experiences with your mental health journey, making a phone call to reach out to somebody you haven't heard from in a while or somebody that you see struggling, showing up late to work, um, inviting a coworker to lunch, just putting it out there on social media that uh, you're available to talk so people can feel comfortable coming to you. And then finally, building a community and finding ways for crew members to get to know each other um, better through morning meetings or at lunch, doing games, doing contests, scheduling after work or weekend activities, and making sure to include everyone um, is a really great uh, way to build community and support on the job. And thinking more specifically about addressing suicide within a culture of care, there are three stages to consider to make sure you're addressing it holistically. The first is prevention. Um, I've already covered a number of preventative measures and activities in the list that I just reviewed on the two previous slides. Um, but I do wanna talk, uh, take a moment to talk about management and employee training as it relates to preventing suicide specifically. Um, and I think this, this is a tool not only for education, but also for destigmatization, because uh, the more we talk about mental health um, and the more you prioritize it um, as a leader within your company, the more uh, people will follow your example, the more they will talk about it and prioritize it for themselves. Next week is National Suicide Prevention and Construction Week. Um, so it would be a really great time to get started with some training if you have not uh, done so already. There are a number of more in-depth training programs. Um, there are a few listed on this slide. Uh, so Mental Health First Aid, uh, QPR, Living Works, and then Vital Cog, which actually does have a program focused on um, suicide prevention and construction are all um, available and you can learn more um, about some of those um, on their own websites, but also the CIASP website has a link to a shorter um, free Living Works training. Um, there are also a bunch of free training resources available from both CPWR, CIASP, AFSP, and others um, that take less time than these complete programs. So for example, there are toolbox talks on suicide and opioids to use at pre-shift meetings. There's a CPWR program to build worker re resilience, and I have um, some links to those later. Um, the second stage to consider is crisis intervention. Trisha and Jamie are going to talk more about how to help in an, an individual in crisis, but this slide just highlights the task method, tune in, ask, state, and connect. Um, and I just wanted to point out that if you've set up a culture of care already, you can more easily connect someone who is struggling with support programs that are already in place. But one important number to always remember if you're faced with having this conversation is 988 you can call or text 988 to be connected to the National Suicide Lifeline, um, which is certainly not the end of the road, um, but it can be a life-saving first step. Um, and then finally, there's the postvention stage, and this can take shape in um, two different ways, depending on whether there was a suicide attempt or a suicide death. Um, so community support is probably the most important thing to provide in either case. Um, which again is easier to build up gradually by creating a culture of care so that it's already in place before a crisis occurs. Um, the image on the right here is another one that is linked um, and that's a manager's guide to suicide uh, postvention in the workplace. And CISP also has some additional information on their website um, that goes more in depth than this slide. Um, and we'll dr drop a link to that in the chat in a second. Um, and then I just mentioned um, already that CPWR offers free training and other resources. So I highlighted a few on this slide, um, but all of them at, along with resources from other organizations can be found at cpwr.com slash mental health. Um, and here is my contact information for any follow-up questions. Um, 
everyone has my contact information as the webinar host anyway, so you can just reply to your registration emails if needed. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Tricia with AFSP um, to talk more about how you can help. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Tricia Calabrese, and I have the privilege of serving as a Senior Vice President of Programs at AFSP. Um, for those of you that don't know, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is the largest private uh, suicide prevention organization in the United States. We've got chapters in all states, including Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C., and our mission is to save lives and bring hope to those who've lost somebody to suicide. We are grounded in science, and so we offer programs that promote uh, suicide prevention, awareness, education, as well as postvention and loss support. And these programs are developed and delivered both nationally as well as through our chapter infrastructure. So I will share at the end of my presentation how to get involved. Um, we are also the largest private funder of suicide research. Our investment in research really helps shape our programs and where we, we go moving forward in really looking at answering those important questions about suicide and how to prevent it. So as we just heard, um, suicide is a leading cause of death in the United States, and it can be prevented. Um, it is it affects nearly 50,000 people die by suicide every year, and there are well over a million people who survive attempts and millions more who have the thoughts of suicide every year. The impact of suicide is, is intense, so it impacts family, friends, communities, colleagues, and workplaces, even long after somebody has lost their life. And so the key takeaway here is that a majority of people have been affected by suicide in one way or another. Um, all populations do face um, risks for, for suicide, but I think what I wanted to highlight here on this slide is that you can see why we're here. And you had heard just a little bit ago the statistics. So the construction industry ranks the second highest in the industry for suicide. So it's important for us to think about risk factors and protective factors because it helps us understand and recognize the risk factors. There are multiple points of interventions um, that will allow us to help save a life. So this visualization shows a layered approach. In this, the bubbles, you can see the risk factors. So things like head trauma, pain, trauma, substance use, those things are risk factors. Your protective factors would be things like resiliency, um, having access to health care, mental health treatment. Those are your, your protective factors. We layer on a current event and stresses, and then you layer on lethal means. And it, it's all of those things that lead to the, the thoughts of suicide. But well, the one note I really want to make here is that it is really important to know that there is never one reason that someone chooses to take their life. Um, and just to share a little bit ago about some of the construction industry uh, contributing factors, so things like burnout and pain, substance use, uh, another other variations, re, you know, regarding sort of the moving um, across job sites, um, workplace, you know, leading to sort of lack of support um, or consistent support. Shortage of, of work means longer hours, travel away from families and any other support systems. I want you to keep in mind here that thoughts of suicide are very complex and that each person has their own path to feeling suicidal or even attempting suicide. And so the, the thought of somebody who is thinking about suicide, typically what we've learned is that people who experience these behaviors are ambival ambivalent, meaning they part of them wants to live and the other one part, part of them wants to die. So they, they really are conflicted in that. Um, the other thing to think about is that the thought of ending their life is usually part of the mind's problem solving access. So it's not that they want to die. It's rather that this feels to them like a solution, um, which means that they're not able to sort of connect with the, the, the thought process of other solutions. Um, 
The other thing that's important to keep in mind here, though, is that, as I mentioned earlier, millions of people have thoughts of suicide every year and do not go on to attempt suicide. So what's important is for us to think about where do we play a role? And so the good news here is that we all have a role to play to save lives and prevent suicide. Um, the warning signs, we group them into three buckets. So we think of things like talk. Is somebody talking about feeling trapped? Are they talking about pain or feeling hopeless? Um, we also look at things like behavior. Are they sleeping more? Are they acting recklessly? Are they using drugs and alcohol? Are they isolating themselves? Those are behavior changes that we're looking for. And then of course, mood. So we look at things like depression or rage or apathy. Um, even. Um, something else to think about is, is seeing somebody who's who's behaving in these ways in the mood, and then maybe they have this sudden burst of happiness. That is also a warning sign and things to, to think about um, ad addressing somebody who, who has these thoughts. So now what do you do? So let's let's say you're you're talking to a colleague and you're noticing that they're talking about things in a way that you know, we just learned um, they're behaving in a certain way. Their mood is is changing. Um, at this point, we we invite people and ask them to ask questions and listen. Um, it impacts these thoughts impact people in different ways, and so this is a really great opportunity to just say, "How does that make you feel? I'm here for you." Um, kind of those reassuring validations. And just showing that support and empathy is really important to um, making that first touch point of contact. The other thing that I think is important is that people do worry that if you ask somebody about suicide, that you're going to get this thought in their head. And actually, the research shows the opposite. Um, if asking somebody if they're considering suicide is not going to put that idea in their head. In fact, if you are thinking that somebody is 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 considering suicide, trust your gut and assume that you're the only one that's going to ask them. Um, and you can be direct. You know, are you thinking of ending your life? Are you thinking about suicide? Having those conversations and being a trusted person to listen. And once you've sort of gone through these, these steps, I think, you know, reiterate that you're so glad that you had an opportunity to connect with them. Remind them that we all have challenges at times and there's resources and support available. Um, and I think just don't leave it at that, right? If you, you notice something, there's an opportunity to say, thank you for sharing with me. Um, offer help. Do you want me to help you call your therapist tomorrow before work or after work? Um, have those follow-up touch points to just close the loop. I'm going to put a link in the chat at the end of this, but this is a really um, great video. It's very brief, but it does talk about having the conversation and, and also shows some signs to be looking for. So again, when I'm when I'm finished, I will put the, the link in the chat. If somebody's considering suicide, connect to professional help. 988 is definitely a resource that we promote. Um, there are, you know, certainly mental health professionals, EAP programs, um, a number of resources, all of which we've been talking about. But the important thing here is that if someone has a suicide plan or is in crisis and you feel like it's not safe, that is the time to take immediate action. And that's when we would recommend calling 988. So AFSP has been around for many, many years, but earlier this year, we had the unique and amazing opportunity to launch into a partnership with Bechtel. Um, Bechtel has partnered with us on a grant to provide critical resources and programming to reach 500,000 construction workers over the next five years. Um, this initiative is going to really leverage Bechtel's industry knowledge, as well as a combination of our AFSP research um, education, prevention strategies, and messaging, as well as our, our national network of chapters to help reach this audience. We're currently in the middle of conducting an environmental scan so that we can learn from the industry on programmatic needs and messaging and have been great partners with those um, on the call with, with me today. This is going to be an industry-wide initiative and it's gonna involve all of us to play a role to end suicide in the construction industry. And with Bechtel's leadership, 
The goal is to see mental health become as much of a priority as physical health in the industry. I've included some resources here. And again, in the chat, I will put more of them, but there are certainly ways to get involved. Um, whether you are worried about somebody, you're a loss survivor yourself, um, or maybe are concerned yourself, there are many resources available and I will be putting those in the chat. So thank you. I will turn it over now. Can you guys see my screen? Looks good. Fantastic, thanks. Good afternoon or good morning if you're on the West Coast, so glad to be here. Um, I really appreciate being invited to be a part of this conversation, both in my role as the Director of Health Promotion with Laborers Health and Safety Fund of North America, and my role as the chairperson of the Board of Trustees for the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention, two organizations that I'm very proud to be a part of. Um, the, the areas that I'm primarily going to focus on today, actually, all right, I'm able to advance my own slides, thanks. Uh, just kind of a quick, rundown of what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, we're seeing a lot of traction around something that's called peer support. Uh, we've had a really robust and really good conversation about the statistics. Amber laid out for us the extent of the problem. Jess talked about changing the culture, and Trisha talked about uh, looking for signs for symptoms, and then kind of how do we have this conversation. Uh, another place where we're noticing that we're getting a lot of help, especially within the industry, has to do with peer support. So I'm going to talk about peer support for a little bit. I'm going to talk about a peer support effort and initiative that the Laborers International Union of North America just recently launched at our August leadership conference. Uh, the Laborers Health and Safety Fund of North America, where I work, is affiliated with LIUNA. Uh, so we're going to talk about an initiative there, and then we're going to talk about resources. Um, and in addition to a list of resources, just some ways, again, at LIUNA and in the Laborers Health and Safety Fund, how we're really trying to get these resources to the people who need them and to have the application be as usable um, and as accessible as possible. Uh, because finding resources by itself, if anyone has ever had to try and find either a medical or a mental health resource for yourself or someone else can be incredibly frustrating and take a lot of patience and a lot of fortitude and sometimes a knowledge of a healthcare system that can be incredibly complex and confusing. Um, and I say that as a professional in this space who has had frustration navigating that system myself. Uh, so focusing on the importance of peer support. As we know, stigma is one of the greatest barriers to people talking about these issues and seeking to get help. One of the greatest values of peer support that we are seeing firsthand and that we know historically is that peer support is intended to create a safe space for people to feel comfortable and trust that they can reach out for help without judgment. Because after all, judgment is the basis for stigma and a lot of what keeps people from getting help. They're worried about how they will be judged and in turn, how that judgment will impact them. And often they're concerned about it in a negative way. Will they lose their job? Will they be viewed differently? Will they be able to get another job? Um, and those are just a couple of a couple of ways that judgment has a really negative impact on people. Uh, something else that I really like about peer support and that I am learning a lot more about firsthand as I am working with more peer support folks within the Layuna family is uh, that they're really able to address a lot of different issues. Peer support initially in the context of construction started primarily with helping folks with substance use disorders. However, as we are seeing that more people are struggling with more issues, uh, you know, this can be good and bad, but we are seeing that more folks are reaching out to our peer supporters with greater breadth 
and greater depth of issues that they might be struggling with. So we're seeing folks in recovery from substance use disorder. We're also seeing folks who are in recovery from mental health related struggles. And they are reaching out with help around those different issues. The other um, huge advantage that I'm finding in working with the peer supporters, again, across LUNA and quite frankly, across the industry in general, is their knowledge of the treatment community, their knowledge of the mental health community, their knowledge of the behavioral health professional community is tremendous. And they know how to work and weave uh, within this really complicated healthcare system that I just spoke of. They often have contacts at the different treatment centers and different resources where folks need to go to get help. So rather than me or you or someone else necessarily calling and being on an 800 number line, trying to get a list of providers, the peer supporters really know how to navigate this system and reach out to a resource directly cut through a lot of the bureaucratic red tape and be able to get someone the support that they need really quickly. Um, and the way I see it, that's invaluable. I often say that with these mental health related issues, we're trying to figure out how to reconcile business needs and human needs. And I would say to you that peer supporters and peer support programs are really able to address both of those. Um, and then I have gone ahead and just listed some basic bullet points, uh, you know, that we can discuss that I know you can read, but as I mentioned, breaking down the stigma, addressing a variety of issues. Uh, peer supporters often work with, with the member in a union circumstance, with a worker in any environment, and very often it's someone's family member who might be struggling, that's causing stress for them, that might have their mind wandering, that's that's got them really concerned. And peer supporters are able to help and assist and work with families as well, uh, which I think is really, really important. They are also able to assist a diverse group of construction professionals. And when I say diversity, you might say, what do you mean by that? Or you might have your own idea of what diversity means. And keep in mind, this is a really diverse industry in a lot of different ways. It's diverse from a gender perspective, a sex perspective, a cultural perspective, an ethnic perspective, a language perspective. It's also really diverse from the different kinds of jobs that people do. We've got folks who work in the field. We've got people who work in an office. We've got people who might be working close to home. And we've got people who might be on a job far away from home where they don't really have the support of their friends and family that they might have if they were closer. So to me, it's really important that we're looking at, at the diversity of the industry. And again, my experience and the folks that I'm working with um, have done a really good job of being able to meet the needs of the diversity of the workforce. And I know I'm getting a little off script, but if someone were to say to me, where is there room for peer support to grow? I would say it's it's in these more diverse groups that we're saying there's a big push to get more women into the field of construction, to get folks who were previously incarcerated, to get folks who were in recovery. So what does peer support look like? Um, it's growing, it's changing, it's evolving. And I think it's a really exciting aspect of behavioral health within this industry in particular. Uh, peer support by its nature, it's also great to be able to connect with people who understand what you do, who understand what you might be going through, who understand the reluctance to get help to reach out, and who understand the nature of the industry. Very often, uh, financial concerns also get in the way of people getting help. A lot of times with a lot of different jobs, if you don't work, you don't get paid in this industry. So the people who are providing the peer support really and truly understand some of the inherent and literal visceral uh, challenges to some folks when it comes to reaching out and getting help. Peer support can also be done uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We're also seeing a lot more peer support and support groups being formed on a group basis. Also, and I think it's incredibly important to mention this, that at its heart, peer support really should be confidential. And I think that confidentiality is something that a lot of folks worry about and is a big reason why a lot of people don't reach out and get the help that they need. 
So if we're able to encourage peer supporters and train peer supporters to maintain that confidentiality and anonymity when people want it and need it, they're going to see a lot of success. Um, as I did say in my introductory remarks, one way that we are addressing peer support through LAYUNA, or I'm going to give you an example of how we're doing that through LAYUNA, is uh, a program that's called LEAN. And you'll notice on here, the acronym LEAN is Laborers Escaping Adversity Now. This program initially started in about 2017, 2018, in one of our 83 health and welfare funds. And LEAN initially stood for Laborers Escaping Addiction Now. Uh, we currently have two of our 83 health and welfare funds with these LEAN programs. Uh, they've been really successful. They're doing really good work. They're making a really positive difference for a lot of different people. And as we were watching this through our National Health and Safety Fund, uh, we decided that more folks need to know about this program, that we need to have more peer support programs across LIUNA. And recognizing, especially since the pandemic, that many folks are struggling with a lot of different kinds of behavioral health related issues. We did tweak the acronym a little bit with permission from each of those two existing health and welfare funds. And we are now calling it Laborers Escaping Adversity Now. Um, our goal is to roll this out to as many different LIUNA affiliates that would like to take advantage of some kind of peer support program as we can. The way we've currently built this program We've got four different levels, recognizing that peer support and, and the uh, leadership support around it and the financial support around it might look different in different places across the country and through different affiliates. So we've got a peer support level. We're at a bare minimum. We're asking LIUNA affiliates, can you please find out what the resources are that are available to your workforce and make those resources available so that when someone needs help, they don't necessarily have to reach out and ask for help. They already know where to go to get it. Our second level is encouraging local unions, district councils, wherever uh, the appropriate affiliate might exist to start a peer support program. Uh, so that's level two. Level three is that we know we've got folks who are out on the jobs who might be self-identified champions who are providing peer support and needed. And, uh, you know, it's kind of unofficially known that they're the go-to people. So we're trying to put a little more structure around those roles. And then our fourth level is a formal lean support program that would be provided as our current two are, either through a health and welfare fund, through a district council. And with those programs, we've got folks who at one point did work in the field of construction. They are now out of the field and working full-time on staff for the Health and Welfare Fund in the capacity of providing peer support to the different members who get their benefits through that fund. So that's been a really exciting new initiative. Like I said, we launched that at our leadership conference this past August, and we are looking to more formally roll that out effective January 2025. We're putting together um, a guidebook and, you know, just kind of a blueprint, if you will, recognizing this is a big industry. There are a lot of different players in it, and peer support in one place might look a little different than peer support somewhere else. Uh, the next part of what I'm going to talk about, and I can go through this a little bit more quickly, is the importance of resources and their distribution. Like I said to you, the first level of the LEAN program is making sure that people know that there are resources available to them and what those resources are. And so keep in mind, uh, when we're getting resources out into the field, we're trying to get resources to people who work in an office, people who work in the field, people who might be employees, of an owner or a contractor, people who might be employees of an association, of a union, people who might have resources in their backyard, and as we discussed, people who might be away from home. So what are those resources available for them? 
uh, something that I've become really uh, acquainted with, especially working with our health and welfare funds, is that not everyone likes to receive their information in the same way. So how is it that we're sharing this resource information with the people on the other end who we want to get it? Some people really like getting an email. Some people still like to get stuff, paper, hard copy, in the mail. Uh, and some people want to text. Just the other day, I said to someone, I want to send some links to you. And they said, that's great, but you can't send them to me because I have a flip phone. But you can send them to my business manager in the union because he has an email address and I'm comfortable with you sending the links to him. Uh, you'll notice on this slide, I included an example of uh, one document that we're using within the Laborers Health and Safety Fund to try and help make gathering this resource information as easy as possible. So we kind of did like a fill in the blank at a bare minimum, what kind of resources should you as a leader within this industry or uh, anyone within the industry, quite frankly, because we're all in a position to help and make a difference in someone's life. So what information would it be great that people have on hand? I know we talk a lot about 988. That is a wonderful resource. I personally have had to use it with multiple people. It's great, uh, but it really is intended to be used in a crisis or an emergency, or if there is no other known resource around. Um, but if someone's not necessarily in a crisis or they may be looking for more of an ongoing resource, I would encourage you, and we are going to be sending out this slide deck, uh, have at it, use this form, modify it, adjust it. So we've got some blank spaces to be filled in. We've also included four uh, national resources we're aware of that we think do a really good job across the board in a variety of different communities. Um, and then some fill in the blanks for what might be example locally. Um, I am aware of some really, really great resources, let's say in the Boston area, and then some very different resources that might exist in the Los Angeles area or the St. Louis area. So those really need to be tailored to, uh, to the groups that you're sending the resources to. Uh, just want to put out there that another resource as we're talking about behavioral health would be naloxone. Some of the speakers spoke about the high rates of opioid use and then sadly sometimes abuse and overdose in the industry. Uh, just recently, I believe in March of this year, the White House did put out um, a pledge encouraging that all affiliates within the industry would pledge to keep naloxone on job sites, would train employees around naloxone. So if you go to the White House website, you and maybe we can drop in the chat if someone can find that. But there is a White House challenge to save lives from opioid overdoses real quick. It's a nationwide call to action to stakeholders to commit to save lives by increasing training on and access to life-saving naloxone. I would encourage that benefit information around insurance be made available and community resources. Uh, the last slide that I'd like to draw your attention to, I know we want to get to Q&A. Uh, we've all kind of mentioned Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. If you go onto that website on all of the different tabs on each one, you will find a different resource and on some tabs, multiple resources. We've got a pledge available that can be taken. It's called the STAND Pledge, S-T-A-N-D. And that stands for Safe Training Awareness Normalize. I'm sorry, Safe Training Awareness Normalize and Decrease. Uh, so an employer can take the pledge, a union can take the pledge, anyone can take the pledge. We've got a toolbox talks that goes along with each of those letters. It corresponds. We've also got a needs analysis on the website. If anyone is interested, there is a place on the website where you can go and fill out an information sheet that you're interested. We've got hard hat stickers. We've got posters. We've got uh, um, poker chips that everyone has seen. I've got a health and safety poker chip. I should have had a CIASP poker chip, but you know, these little poker chips with 988. Uh, we've got wallet cards. There are multiple free trainings on the website through Living Works as well as MindWise where someone can take a self-assessment. And you'll notice on the right-hand corner of the slides, looking at your screen, 
lots and lots and lots of social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, I believe I have probably gone over my time, but hopefully folks have found the information helpful and useful from myself and all of my co-presenters today. So thank you so much for taking these issues so seriously and for caring about them and the people who you work with. Thanks, Jess. Thank you to all of our presenters and for all of you for putting a tremendous amount of questions into both the chat and the Q&A. We do have time for a few. I know a couple of them have been answered as we go on, but I would like to pose one of the questions that was presented in the chat, or I'm sorry, it's actually in the Q&A to Dr. Trueblood, and it was to ask a comparison of deaths by suicide in the construction industry versus that of the um, focus four or fatal four, whatever you want to label it as. So great question. And I put in, um, we do have uh, fatal injury rates calculated per 100,000 FTEs for a lot of various injury types. Um, Unfortunately, that's not directly comparable to the suicide rates due to population differences. However, that is something we can standardize and get out. It's actually on my uh, list because I was looking at doing a comparison a few weeks ago. And I was like, I need to do this. Uh, there's just too much data, not enough time. Um, so at this time, we don't have any directly comparable one-to-one. -one. However, if you're interested in looking at injury rates, um, we have a lot of recent data bulletins with those rates available. And then also the suicide um, rates are available in our latest manuscript. And if that's something you'd like in the future, please reach out to me um, directly. And I try to track everyone. I think a few of the presenters today can say, you know, they do get emails from me. So if you let me know, I try to keep track of that and email you resources that's available. Thank you. I know there was also a couple of questions regarding the Hispanic population, and it looks like they were also answered in that uh, Q&A, so thank you for taking care of that as well. We did have a question that was pre-submitted to us, and that I think I'll pose to Trisha, if you don't mind, and that is, is it possible to get someone help they need without them saying they need the help? Or what do you do when you suspect someone needs assistance, but they're resistant to that? Yeah, it's a good question and a complicated situation to be in for sure. Having been in that situation myself where you are really worried about somebody and they may be resistant to getting help. And I think, you know, one is kind of going back to what we had talked about with sort of the listening, asking questions, being direct, um, and really kind of trying to get them to um, trust in you and being able to then make that connection, um, reassuring them that help is available. You know, mental health is the same as physical health. We really want that message to be, you know, shared. I'm thinking about, you know, mental health. There's no stigma when you have a heart attack, right? There's no stigma when you have cancer. This is the same kind of thing and reiterating that. Um, obviously, if somebody is in a moment of crisis and you are very worried, it is not safe. At that point, we do say call 911 or call 988, um, depending on, on the situation. You definitely can, at that point, step in and, and make sure you get them to safety, particularly if, like I said, they are, are in a moment of crisis. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, another one of our pre-posed questions, and this one I'll, I'll pose to Jamie, if you don't mind. What funding mechanisms are there to help workers seek mental health treatment? Um, thank you very much for the question, Sonia. So I had discussed the peers helping folks to get connected, and this is something else peers would know about, although quite frankly, I want to share this so that everyone knows about it. Um, a lot of times at a treatment center or some kind of recovery center, and this is specific to substance use disorders, there are what are called scholarships, and those kind of work on like a sliding, uh, sliding fee scale and or it's uh, almost like a stipend or money that's given to someone to help defray the cost for the treatment, recognizing that, that treatment without insurance, and quite frankly, sometimes even treatment with insurance can be exorbitantly expensive. 
while we are talking about the benefits, I would also encourage, and it's sad because someone might be in the middle of an emergency, in which case we just have to get them the help that they need, but in network versus out of network might very much make a difference. And that's something that but, um, I would encourage as you're putting your list of resources together, uh, if it's possible to try and be aware of those nuances, although we don't expect people to be benefits experts, but we do know that the benefits can be really, really complicated. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to turn things over to Jess now to wrap things up for us. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks everyone else for joining, um, both our panelists and everyone who took time out of your day to be here. Um, uh, you probably caught a lot going on in the chat. I'm going to take everything that was shared in the chat, and um, if the links are not already in the presentation, I'm going to go ahead and compile those into a list so that I can share those out in the follow-up email. Um, give me a few days to get the recording together and all of the resources into a list, and I will probably be sending out the follow-up email early next week. Um, and of course, feel free, I know we didn't get through all of the questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Tricia or Jamie or Amber directly, um, or I'm happy to put you in touch with anyone from our panel. Um, and please check out the, the resources that we all shared, because again, this is such an important topic. Um, so with that, I will wish everyone a good afternoon and thank you again for coming. Thanks again, Tricia, Jamie, and Amber.